All right, our next speaker uh, for the day is Iman Wu. Iman Wu is the current head of product management and user experiments at Tenmarks, which creates software to help teachers provide personal instructions for their students. She graduated uh, with an EECS, BS, and MBA from UC Berkeley as well. Um, thanks so much for having me here today. It's really an honor to be here. Um, it, the campus has changed so much um, from when I was here. I remember um, I was very active in Society of Women Engineers, and we were in the Naval Architecture Building, which I think now has been subsumed into the um, Loom Building. Uh, but anyway, it's fantastic to be here. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is actually not so much technical, but I thought it would be something that would be useful to um, each of us in terms of our um, work life. So one thing I wanted to just check in is, um, how many of you out there are students? OK, great. And then how many are working full time? Okay, so half and half. So, and I know being a student is full time. But um, what I'm going to um, go through is actually more in a traditional work setting. But um, I, all of us eventually, I think, will um, be out in the workforce. So I thought that would be relevant to share with you guys. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but just to say that I've had a very, very nonlinear career path. I've gone from hardware engineering um, into um, marketing of financial services to product management of financial technology to marketing automation software and now to ed tech. So many of the things, product management didn't exist when I was at Berkeley as an undergrad, and education technology and software as a service, all these things didn't exist um, when I was here. And so I'm really excited about what the next um, few decades um, bring. So who here would be interested in knowing what the secret behind great performance is at work? OK, a good majority of you. That's good. So that's what I'm here to talk about in my seven minutes. Um, so quick question is, for those of you who are working, um, think about the last six months. On average, how many hours a week were you working? So how, raise your hand if it was less than 40, typically. OK, um, 40 to 50. Great. And then, uh, I, I like how Sheila's retired and working 40 to 50 hours a week. Um, OK, <laughs> who's working um, 51 to 60 hours? Yep, good number. Um, 61 to 65, this is a very tight band. All right, and then more than, more than that? OK, great. You guys are in good company. Um, there's some stats here. So <clears throat> there was a um, study done by a Harvard Business School professor, Leslie Perlow. She surveyed 1,000 people across the different um, industries, and she found that 94% of people work 50 hours or more, um, and 50% hour, 50 work 65 hours or more. Um, so similarly, there was a study done by a management writer, Sylvia Ann Hewlett, of high earners, and she found that 35%, a third, worked 60 hours or more, and then 10% worked 80 hours or more. So you can see that um, we definitely have a work culture that's like, you know, if you work harder and you do more, then you'll do better, right? So. So this is the first aha of the talk, hopefully, which is that, that the number of hours that you work is not the secret to uh, top performance. So what happens is there is the, this is essentially a U-shaped curve. Um, so you definitely get a big bang for your buck as you increase your work time from 30 to 50 hours in the work week. Um, but once you go from 50 to 65, it's still increasing, but at a diminishing rate. And then once you go past 65, I know it's subtle, but it actually has a negative slope to it. So you're actually, it's becoming detrimental to your productivity. And I can speak from experience that, like, at one of those companies, there was this nine-month period where I essentially was working 80 hours a week. Um, and I, just because I felt like I had, you know, made these obligations to the business and said I was going to do these things. And so I was working crazy hours. And I know absolutely that by the end of that, I was so burnt out. And like when I was trying to write requirements at two or three in the morning, I was working very slowly. And I'm sure I made a ton of mistakes in my requirements. So what's really interesting is my talk is based on a new book that just came out called Great at Work, which is by Professor Morton Hansen. He's actually at Berkeley. Um, and What's really fascinating to me is you can see this really thin slice called hours per week. That's the impact that he found that um, your number of hours working has on your performance at work. 
Um, so then we combine that with demographics, which is um, gender, age, years of education, your tenure, that's all 10%. Um, and then there's 24% that's unexplained. And then the magical 66%, that big slice, I'm just gonna give you a tidbit of that, is um, he's written a very accessible book um, based on his five years of research. This is empirical data, so he's done qualitative research with over 100 people and then vetted that with a quantitative survey of um, research, tons of regression analysis and things like that with 5,000 people. Um, that was across gender, age, um, professions, uh, you know, ranged from like, you know, they're engineers, software programmers, but then they're also like casino dealers and manufacturing workers and teachers and things like that. So 66% um, can be accounted by these work smart practices. So just totally want to give a plug. None of this is my novel thinking. Um, I just was so taken by this book that I read recently. I thought this would be something really meaningful to share with you guys here. So again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to go through all seven of these. But the snapshot is that um, four out of the seven have to do with things that are related to how you do your work. And then three out of the seven is related to how you work with others. Because the reality is everything that we do today, very little of it is purely individual contributor. So much of it relies on teams and collaboration with others. So in today's talk, I'm either going to go through one or two of these, depending on how much time we have. Um, so the first one is P squared, um, which is passion and purpose. So my guess is that. Um, fast forward, like let's say two months from now, come May, June, lots of us will be seeing stuff in our Facebook feeds of like this amazing commencement speech by this person. Um, and oftentimes the theme is follow your passion. Um, like if you do what, you know, like this, I remember this phrase that this woman said to me like 20 years ago and it really stayed with me, just like figure out what makes your heart sing. And I was like, I totally want to do that. Um, so, but the key is that when you look at all those commencement speeches, there is very, very heavy selection bias going on here. So in order to be invited as a <laughs> commencement speaker, you're already really successful. So what um, Professor Hansen figured out in his research, it was actually, it's the combination of two things, which is still very much within our control. So it's passion still is there, but then you actually combine it with purpose. So the idea is don't just blindly listen to follow your passion. Um, an example of this in the book that he shares is of a 42-year-old man who was a, um, <clears throat> doing really well in his role of being a social policy researcher. Um, at the age of 42, he had a mini um, midlife crisis. He saw a TED talk um, about an economics professor who basically was espousing um, follow your passion. So he took it to heart and he decided to quit his job and he followed his dream of becoming a digital copywriter. He um, ended up dipping into his retirement savings going to his parents for money in order to pay for his health care because he no longer had health care anymore. Um, he ended up not being successful in his job, ended up becoming a dog walker and ultimately had a mental breakdown. And I think basically was kind of like, oh, that didn't quite work out that I followed my dream. So that might be an extreme example, but just, you know, again, wanted to paint that as a um, context. So if you, but if you've married the two, which is follow your passion and you find a sense of purpose in your work, that's where the magic is. So, so the idea is, put another way, you want to do what you love, so you know, find what makes your heart sing, but also do something that contributes. And the definition of what contributes can be really wide. It doesn't mean that you have to be like, um, you know, solving global warming or solving the poverty um, issues that we have across the world. It can just be find value and how you can contribute, whether it be in your you know, local space or broader. So a great example that Professor Hansen shares in his book is of Genevieve, who is a concierge at a hotel in Canada. Um, and in her words, um, what she believes her job is to do is to improve the lives of others through personal touch. <clears throat> and she really takes that to heart. So, that means you know, she finds the right musical or the right restaurant to book when asked, but it also means that she's willing to go above and beyond. So there was a documentary photographer that came to the hotel and wanted to profile Quebec and um, had asked like, oh, you know, could you help me find like a dozen unique objects from Quebec that really signify the culture of the city? And so instead of just saying, eh, sorry, that's you know, not really my job description, she decided to embrace it and she actually spent several days like, um, going around town, collecting all these objects like a snowy owl. She talked to a researcher to get access to these like special butterflies and things like that. So she went above and beyond 
delighted her customer, the photographer, but also brought joy to herself because she was doing what she loves, which is connecting to people and helping them. So again, if you can find that combination, not just follow your passion, but also figure out what contributes, um, then that, is, that actually accounts for 18%. So if you go back to that 66% um, of the top performance, 18% um, of that is accounted for if you can find that matching between find your passion and find your purpose. And how am I doing on time? 20 seconds. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the next slide. Anyway, there are um, other things you can do. There is, I'm going to again probably promote um, Professor Hansen. He has a website, www.mortonhansen.com. There's a very short quiz you can take there to find out how you rate across those seven dimensions. His book is super accessible. It's well-researched, but also very um, tangible in like, what you can actually do day to day to make changes and improvements. Um, and it's a simple, he'll give you tips at like literally 15 minutes a day, and who doesn't have 15 minutes a day to spare, um, you can do to improve. Thanks.